So as I was saying, we're going to st end on a more positive note. What can architecture do in the context of so many mammoth uh, historic uh, forces and enormous scale of economic forces? Um, in 1923, two architects faced each other across the stage in the town of Bandung, uh, Dutch colonial Java. And uh, they were there to debate what is the right approach of architecture for the context of Dutch colonial Indonesia. Uh, everyone on stage and everyone in the audience were all in agreement that architecture was going to be of the most, one of the most important things that was going to define how Dutch colonial uh, policy played out over the over the next coming centuries as the Dutch continued to rule Indonesia. Um, the debate was between uh, whether or not there was anything in the, if there, whether there was anything, this is, this is where the debate was in a building like this. Um, is there anything of value in Javanese culture worthy of emulation uh, architecturally in, mo in the context of modernism uh, of bringing the benefits of modern technological development to the most people. Remember what we said about the 20th century? Well, this was the moment of truth in the 1920s where architecture was being deployed all over the world to deliver on the promise of technological and social advancement and political advancement. And they were going to, the Dutch uh, the ethnic Dutch colonial people of Indonesia, which was called the Dutch East Indies at the time, were all committed to turning around the oppression of colonialism. Uh, not all of them, but everyone in this hall uh, was committed to turning around the oppression and bringing benefits to the Javanese and the other ethnic groups of the Dutch colonies. And so <clears throat> the debate was really as to whether uh, there was anything of value in uh, Javanese culture because in the tradition of Frank Lloyd Wright, now did you study Frank Lloyd Wright in history of architecture? Mm -hmm. What did you study? <laughs> what, what example did you look at of Frank Lloyd Wright? Falling water. Falling water. Roby House, the Roby House, the prairie style. So at the end of Frank Lloyd Wright's career, uh, his early career where he designed all the prairie houses, this guy in Germany went bonkers. He just loved all this stuff. Um, and he published a portfolio, the Wasmuth portfolio in Berlin, uh, to promote this, the work that he had seen. And it took off. It took a life of its own. And uh, uh, Henri Petrus Berlacha, Heinrich Petrus Berlacha, or Berlage, as the, I guess we, do we say Berlage? Berlag? I don't know. But he became one of the promoters of what became known as the Amsterdam School. So Frank Lloyd Wright, through this Berlin publication, uh, became the spark that triggered this vast uh, development of the Amsterdam School that, uh, grew out of the arts and crafts tradition of showing materiality and tectonic expression in very clear ways. Uh, and this is the Berlacher's um, expansion of Amsterdam called Amsterdam South. Uh, Michel de Klerk uh, was the architect of much of this. But you can kind of sense the spirit of Frank Lloyd Wright coming through in the material expression. And Berlach um, finally went from Amsterdam uh, and to a co the colony of the Dutch. Remember the Netherlands, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, what's their colony? Indonesia. He traveled there and uh, the same year as this debate that we started and he opined very heavily in favor of Indonesian uh, cultures, all these different ethnic traditions as having value and he did these sketches and published them uh, and it was very interesting. At the same time there, uh, this is what was happening, that the, uh, the Art Deco, Art Nouveau, whatever was the latest trend in Europe uh, in Amsterdam and Rotterdam 
were being reproduced in the colonies. And so this is the city of Bandung. Um, and the, the, um, the styles of Europe were sweeping through. And the question was, is this the right thing? European styles spreading through the colonies, or should we go back to some tradition? Now, a lot of people, a lot of architects had been traveling to these colonies for, for decades and saying, uh, there's really nothing that we would call architecture in Java except the great stone monuments. This is Borobudur, the, Buddha, the largest Buddhist monument in the world, and then the largest, one of the largest Hindu complexes in the world, right nearby in Prambanan. Have you been there? Uh, yeah. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. But these are dead cultures. Uh, the, pe the cultures and societies uh, that built these buildings disappeared and Islam came in and there was no more. So these are dead monuments, uh, but these Dutch architects were saying, there's nothing worthy of the name architecture except these great stone monuments. And they thought that these stone monuments were the result of colonization from India, but they weren't. It's just the Javanese fell in love with everything Hindu and Buddhist and uh, made it their own. Um, but on the other side of the stage, uh, so Schumacher was the architect saying, uh, not only is, is there nothing but this, but the, the traditional Javanese buildings are flimsy. They're made out of bamboo. Uh, they, they're, they're just sheds. They're just utilitarian sheds. And they, the only good thing about them is they're made out of wood, so they, they decay very rapidly and disappear back into the jungle out of which they came. So really derogatory, talking about the palaces of the, of the rulers being uh, mistaken for a bicycle shed. Um, really not very happy, not very flattering with the indigenous culture. Now on the other side of the stage from Schu Schumacher was Pont. Pont was, uh, both of them were Dutch, uh, but Pont was married to a Javanese woman and was in love with all kinds, of, not just the Javanese woman, but uh, Javanese culture. And he spent three years going through the jungles um, as part of a colonial policy of outlawing bamboo construction, saying you're not allowed to build in bamboo because bamboo rots quickly. It uh, gets infested with uh, insects and rats and rodents. So the colonial policy was to eliminate bamboo architecture. Uh, but that was very difficult because the way um, collective buildings uh, were built was everyone would build a beam or a truss or uh, an element and contribute that element so the buildings could be built as a collective process without any cash. As soon as you move from bamboo to timbers, you need a special carpenter who, can, who needs to be paid. And so you have to move to a cash economy and it made it much more difficult for the natural cultural expression in building to occur in, throughout the uh, colonies. And so um, Pont noticed the oppression of the colonial policy, the well-intended colonial policy as a health issue, but it really was devastating to the social practices around the architecture. Uh, he also noticed um, this, he, this was part of it, that there was a sagging in the roof. And Schumacher said, this is further demonstration of the lack of sophistication of the Indonesians, is that they, they don't even know how to use structure. Uh, they have no structural principles. Look at these saggy roofs. Um, I won't go into that. Um, and Pont uh, basically uh, had no answer. And so he kind of lost the debate. And there was a lot at stake for him because he had, a few years earlier, designed the Bandung Institute of Technology based on, like, like Wentworth, Bandung Institute of Technology was based on the model of MIT and the technical schools back in the Netherlands. Um, and we'll see that later. But after this debate, he went and he studied the structures of these uh, flimsy wooden structures and bamboo structures. And this is the one that um, became interesting to me, is the Bang Bang Salvitono. It's one of the more dramatic uh, versions of these saggy roofs where they pass over fulcrum and the lower roof hangs on the tail end of the upper roof. And he develops this theory through these sections. 
this sectional analysis of all these buildings in Java, that the upper roof is actually a tensile structure, like a tent. And so it's actually a very sophisticated structural move, very deliberate and very much on purpose. Um, and so uh, Schumacher, who won the debate, uh, went on to design lots of things. And again, emulating Frank Lloyd Wright, this is Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, uh, where he takes a modern structure and he embellishes the structure with these motifs, um, this kind of a Mayan motif on the hotel in, in Tokyo. You notice that the Mayan motif has nothing whatsoever to do with Japanese culture. Uh, but this was Frank Lloyd Wright's idea that you take a modern structure and you decorate it with these motifs from some great culture in the past. And so Schumacher did that in his hotel building uh, in Bandung uh, a few years after the debate. Very much in direct emulation of what Frank Lloyd Wright was doing um, in Tokyo. And so in both sides of the stage, you have Schumacher saying, I'm going to do what Frank Lloyd Wright did. And on the other side of the stage, you have Pont with support of Berlage, who was uh, a big promoter of the Frank Lloyd Wright approach to architecture, taking a contrary point of view that the indigenous motifs were worthy of bringing into and translating into modern architectural form. Um, not like this, but um, Otherwise, this is at the palace uh, in central Java, where I was working uh, in the 90s. And um, this is the Bangsal Witono, the building that Pont uh, drew in his analysis. This is the place where I had gotten a grant uh, to run a, um, a two-week workshop uh, to train architects on the recording of traditional buildings. And so we measured and drew, took castings, and we were puzzled by this whole very strange thing where the lower roof isn't resting on the beams and columns of this structure. The lower roof was hanging off of a beam that was attached to the rafter tails of the roof above. And so, like a tent, it was pulling this. The weight of this would make it sag, but the weight of the lower roof would then lift it up. So it was a very interesting bizarre thing, uh, and Pont and we, working uh, in solo, uh, actually discovered the same, in the sim same way. We were doing this before I was aware of Pont's um, uh, analysis of this building, trying to figure out what's going on up there structurally. Um, and what it is, is these beams are supporting the roof, but the roof is, this is like a fulcrum point. And so the weight down here is, is leveraging over the fulcrum point to lift up the upper roof. And this is Pont's building in Bondum in 1923, where his job, he felt, was to legitimize this traditional Javanese architectural expression, uh, but not just the Javanese. Remember Larry Vale's uh, analysis of capitals and how important it was not to over uh, emphasize a single subnational culture. Well, he was aware of this in the 20s, and so he tried to mix the Sumatran style with the Javanese style with the Balinese style. And so this is really a hybrid hodgepodge of different formal expressions on top of a Dutch truss system. So the technological sophistication of Dutch engineering and the expressive capacity of the roof form this is uh, last year, I, w I went to an event in that hall, um, and here we are still using this hall. It's really a, a glorious uh, piece of architecture um, with this structural expression. Um, but we're going to take a brief, let's see. But the, I'm going to end it and continue in my home studio. But it really is very much Unlike the sophisticated structural expression that Pont discovered after he built this building, this is not that. This is really a, a highly engineered modern Dutch structure with a form stuck on it, not so different from the Chinatown gates. The, the, the structure 
is separate, is a separate conception, and the form is just stuck on top of it. And um, it's that this is the key relationship of this lecture. And Pont, after he did his research, uh, so he did this first, not understanding the sophisticated structural uh, bending process uh, that he discovered after he did this. So after the lecture, uh, which he arguably lost, uh, the debate that he lost, he realized that what he had done here was really not that much better than what Schumacher was doing in the hotel. He was making a, a modern structure and just sticking some decorative aspects on it, which is uh, completely against what, and you've probably studied this at some point, you've certainly been under the influence of this word, right? Some of you are even in the tectonic concentration, I believe. So um, this book was really fundamental to the understanding of what that concentration is. And the idea of tectonics is that the cultural expression is directly connected to the material structural operation of the building. And so this goes directly against the principles of tectonic expression. And Pont spent the rest of his career experimenting with buildings that the form was a direct result of the material structural connections and bending and forces. So when the wind blows, the curve changes on these buildings. And uh, when there's an earthquake, the whole thing shimmies and shuffles and changes form because there's a very direct connection between the material structural uh, operation of the building and the form that it takes on. So the key question of the tectonic uh, analysis of a building lies in how integrated the structure and material qualities and character are to the overarching form. When it is disconnected, then you have what Robert Venturi would have referred to as a decorated shed. And, uh, or another way of thinking that is just a separation between the building and its expression. And so you might think of uh, a standard office building with a different roof form or a different skin, and the expressive power is in the roof form or the skin, the visible elements uh, of the building, and what underlies the structure, uh, the framing, the, uh, the interiors, all of those are separate uh, somehow. They're not uh, an integral whole. And so that would be something without a strong tectonic expression uh, in terms of uh, having a, a stronger connection and integral, integrated nature between uh, what the building actually is and what the building looks like. And so a separation between the operation of the building structurally materially and its visual expression. On the other hand, you have things that are tectonically integrated, uh, as in this case, where the structure and material, the connections, they make up the building's expression. Uh, the, the connection is very strong. In Robert Venturi's terms, that he would have called that a duck, although a duck doesn't really rise to the level his example of the duck building does not rise to the level of what Kenneth Frampton and others would describe as uh, something uh, with a strong tectonic expression. Um, it's uh, important that you learn this at least one time before you graduate. So um, this is actually a, a key uh, point that you need to take away um, from this example. But it doesn't stop there. The interesting thing that um, Pont did, and this is, uh, Abedin Kusno has written about this. Um, he talks about how what Pont did in this example with this analysis was he legitimized the indigenous structural uh, ideas and transformed it from ha mere handicraft handicraft to a scientific, rational, uh, more legitimate uh, from a point of view of modernism. 
uh, he legitimized it in a way by making it available to technical scientific analysis. But in the process, uh, as Kusno points out, he also ran the risk of uh, reducing the much greater sophistication uh, that is cloaked by the mere technical appreciation of it. This is Pa Asmo. He was my partner in the, um, the work done at the palace in central Java. He is a carpenter, a uh, very knowledgeable carpenter with a preference for hand tools. Uh, and that preference is not just something, a personal preference. It relates to his role as the royal uh, architect, craftsman, priest of the palace. And you see the ribbon around his neck, it indi and the, uh, it indicates a sacred uh, connection to the Queen of the South Seas. Uh, anyone entering the palace um, must indicate that they are allies of the king by wearing this ribbon. And so you doing work, uh, all of us um, wore these ribbons. Uh, so he is here fashioning one of the main columns of the tower. Uh, dedicated to the Queen of the South Seas. Uh, at the top of the tower, no one is allowed into the upper chamber except for the king once a year to renew his conjugal connection with the queen, the mystical Queen of the South Seas. And here, Paasmo is in his official princely garb uh, for the coronation of the king uh, ceremony, uh, indicating his high station and his uh, status as a priest, not just a carpenter. So uh, he is the quintessential architect priest in this system. And uh, it is his job to interpret the sacred books of uh, building that are very popular, <clears throat> very common throughout uh, Indonesia that capture the rules of how to build different elements of structures and it's all based on uh, human dimension and every element of the building uh, has a name and the name simultaneously refers to a technical functional uh, operation of that element at the same time it is uh, an analogy it establishes an analogy that puts it in relationship to the larger hierarchy of the cosmological order uh, according to the Hindu Javanese um, system, religious system. Um, and so each of these words would have uh, not just a technical meaning but also a mystical spiritual meaning. And here we see uh, the, the typology of buildings. There are over a hundred different types of buildings and it is not uh, is it is not a case where there's a segregation between uh, the building and its expression. These buildings are all very much tectonically expressive, that the structural aspects are very directly linked to their outward expression um, throughout. And these two types are in the section related to the hanging roof that we were looking at and that uh, fascinated Pont so much. Now it's not appropriate to have every roof uh, of every building or just any roof of any building uh, be of the hanging type. It is actually restricted to a very specific narrow range of types of building with for a certain uh, narrow range of activities uh, and meanings. And so there is a, it is not just a case of technical sophistication, um, but it is also one of constant reinforcing of mystical spiritual meanings uh, throughout that uh, system of tectonic expression during construction and after. And in the context of a place where uh, elements from other countries are constantly being javanized and brought in and absorbed and adapted uh, and becoming a very core part of Javanese culture. It is important uh, that some things are not just superficially expressive of this kind of uh, connection, these kind of integration, but some things are actually 
uh, down to the bones, uh, very much a part of the method of meaning construction. And so uh, what we see here is a, a broad range of cultural formation. You can either uh, superficially just say this Dutch carriage is now a Javanese uh, uh, object of power playing a specific role at the core of the balance between heaven and earth, uh, or you can uh, embed these things in a much deeper way. And so this key question in architecture leads us to a quick side trip uh, and then a final example to cap it off. So the quick side trip is uh, to a different portion of the South Pacific uh, about, well, I'm not sure how many thousands of miles away from Java, maybe two. Um, you may have heard of the Grand Projet, the grand projects of President Mitterrand and uh, Charles de Gaulle of France. Uh, the Pompidou Center was one, La Défense was one. Uh, there was a series of ten Grand Projets uh, that were constructed uh, during this period from the 70s onward. And all of them were in Paris uh, until the last one. And there was an outcry that uh, these projects needed to recognize the larger nation of France. And so Mitterrand, uh, in his final Grand Projet, uh, decided to not just recognize continental European France, but to go to the far reaches of the planet and uh, do the final project on the island of New Caledonia, a French colony. Um, which nicely wraps up uh, the examples that we've been working with this semester um, because it is in Asia. Uh, here we see Renzo Piano with his winning um, sketch. Uh, he won the competition and uh, this is a very interesting project of Renzo Piano's. Uh, and it's a great example of some of the issues we're talking about. Renzo Piano, uh, who is famous for always rethinking the methods of architecture with each project. For this project, decided first and foremost to hire an anthropologist because uh, the program for this project is the Jibao Cultural Center in recognition of a hero of New Caledonian uh, struggle for independence. Um, ironically, uh, because it was and is a st still a colony with some autonomy. But there was a revolution, and Jibao, the man uh, pictured here, played a role in uh, strengthening and reinforcing the Kanak culture, uh, which is the indigenous culture to the islands of New Caledonia, and uh, negotiating an end to the military uh, oppression uh, as a, they came as a result of the revolt of the Kanak culture. And so he was the negotiator of the final piece. And with his anthropologist, uh, Renzo Piano, looked at the indigenous building traditions uh, common in the island, but not just the indigenous building conditions, uh, some of the, um, the biological situation, the landscape traditions, the handicrafts. And so this became a source of tectonic uh, understanding of how do the cultural meanings of this indigenous culture embed themselves in the material physical uh, objects uh, and become what we think of as material cultures. Um, material culture is a term that anthropologists use and it is very closely related to our sense of tectonic uh, expression where the material, physical character of a place uh, becomes a vehicle for meaning. And, uh, but Renzo Piano, being who he is, uh, doesn't stop there. He also, uh, as he developed his vocabulary of forms, used the highest technology available at the time. Uh, this is 1993 when uh, the project begins. And in characteristic form, he also uh, creates a vocabulary of steel and wood connection that uh, are just exquisite uh, and demonstrate 
a profound understanding of the physics and the structural uh, character of these materials and how they might best work together. And so the result is really an example of a profound understanding and study prior to the, the development of the concept and the building uh, executed with uh, really remarkable uh, precision and uh, finesse, uh, quality of light, um, it, and it leads right to the, um, all the way out from the smallest detail out to the way the landscape uh, actually provides a narrative path that is essential to the conveyance of meaning to future generations of the Kanak people. And so you have the result, this is uh, one of the photos that captures for me the possibility of a resonance by placing uh, the indigenous uh, forms and material culture in close proximity to the new expressions of uh, meaning for the Kana culture, that uh, the ongoing process of transference uh, or um, the, the taking on of meaning uh, over time uh, is a spatial material operation that is uh, allowed to occur uh, given the final juxtaposition of these um, two buildings. And, and so this is one of my favorite examples. I've always uh, been frustrated that Frampton's examples um, really don't do justice to the character and quality and potential of these ideas of critical regionalism or of uh, tectonic expression. Um, and so I think there needs to be a new ongoing project of, uh, of analysis and understanding through a richer and more deserving set of examples than the ones um, that Frampton provides. Um, which brings us to our next and final um, project. Uh, this links back to earlier in the lecture we, uh, I referred to Ponce's three years working in the colonial service to eliminate the, um, the use of bamboo in housing uh, in the villages and towns throughout the archipelago. And this colonial project was remarkably successful. Uh, and as Pont came to uh, present in multiple housing conferences, uh, not uh, with a net effect that was not completely positive. Yes, it helped reduce uh, insect and, and pestilence and rodent infestations, but it also really uh, undermined the cultural operation of social relations within the village built around the built form of, uh, of housing and other structures. And the way that different households would fabricate different elements in bamboo with no cash outlays. Uh, they, and so collective building projects were routine and new uh, community halls would be built, uh, houses for neighbors would be built, all uh, by sharing labor, um, different people uh, supplying different elements and collective building was a routine part of the social operation of the villages. Uh, but the colonial policy against bamboo eliminated that, as I mentioned earlier in the lecture, and compelled the use of highly skilled carpentry to make these um, complex joints uh, dictated by the primbon. And so you get uh, uh, an abandonment of bamboo building cultures uh, with great impact in terms of the social operation of the village. Um, a Canadian jewelry designer by the name of John Hardy got bored with jewelry and decided to build a school. Uh, he had always been a misfit. He never really was comfortable in schools. Uh, you can see his TED talk where he goes into great detail about how uh, he really felt compelled to reinvent what how school works. And so he is first and foremost a jewelry designer. Secondly, he is an educational reformer. And the buildings that he developed uh, and the way of building he developed uh, to house his green school in Bali uh, is really um, 
not the main thing is contribution, which is usually a cue to the most where the most effective architecture is. The best architecture seems to be produced in conditions where architecture is not the first priority. And that is true here. Um, in a condition without architects, really a group of jewelry designers. Uh, his daughter is a fashion designer, he used to work with Donna Karen, uh, but has come back to Bali to participate in the construction of um, dozens of buildings. Um, they started out looking at um, indigenous indigenous buildings uh, that were still being built in the more remote areas of Indonesia and how do they use those um, how do they construct those buildings using bamboo and then quickly moving on on the basis of those principles to uh, experimenting with other possibilities including curvature uh, grand extensions and here you see the models uh, that were the primary, that are the primary mode of exploration and testing. Um, that the idea starts with a simple sketch, uh, usually by John uh, or his daughter, Elora, and then it's passed along to a team for elaboration uh, in model form. And these models are made out of bamboo, and so there's some, there's a strong connection between the model scale and the full scale. And they've built literally dozens of these models, um, too many to actually store conveniently. Uh, and the model is actually the main mode of operation, that they um, use these models uh, to develop the form, and they use these models to build uh, on the site. Um, and so there would be a model of this, uh, it would then be analyzed, and then uh, the model would be the, the core of the um, process for construction. Um, this is uh, the Green School's main architect. Uh, he is actually the architect priest of the village. And the interesting thing is, speaking with John Hardy, he doesn't seem to care about Balinese culture. He's in Bali, but he could be anywhere, it seems to be his attitude. Um, and uh, this is something that I think uh, will keep me busy in a future research trip, uh, perhaps with students on a study uh, travel studio of the future, hopefully. Um, but I. Uh, John was careful not to let me spend too much time with this guy um, to interview him because I was overflowing with questions clearly about where he, what he's, what's going through his mind as he does this. To what extent is he uh, tapping into the traditional knowledge that he is the, uh, the guardian of. And so uh, it really occurs uh, at the model making form um, the working off of sketches, the model is produced, uh, things are poked and loaded and flex, uh, flexed and where additional elements need to be added, the thickness needs to be changed, um, Made will, will change them. And uh, so the development of the form and structure is simultaneous through actual model making. In the next step, um, John brings in fancy pants uh, college educated architects from Java and they build a 3D, believe it or not, 3D AutoCAD model of these forms, send the files off to the university where they are analyzed structurally uh, in order to create the paper trail that will uh, allow the local building authority to issue a permit and then they abandon the uh, AutoCAD files and go back to the model and so on my visits um, the model has been sitting there in the building site um, the workers come um, measure the sticks in the model and then go off to the stack of bamboo choose the appropriate stick and um, and work with that making adjustments as necessary uh, along the way the uh, everything is built in full scale mocked up uh, in cardboard before actual execution. 
and there is a remarkable degree of invention um, and innovation going on constantly on the building site. Um, uh, something I could talk about for hours, um, but this is the final example, um, and really just to cap it off, it, it's an interesting closing of the circle um, of tectonic expression in bamboo uh, that is uh, coming forward uh, in the present and in the, in the future uh, in a remarkable set of buildings um, that is likely to expand beyond and has already expanded. I've run into this um, bamboo practice, the, the ripple effect of um, the research and development going on in Indonesia around bamboo, especially in this neighborhood in Bali. Uh, has already shown up in Europe, uh, the Museum of Modern Art, um, and the Muse uh, Metropolitan Museum um, in New York, on the rooftop, various art installations, and in Colombia, uh, we've run into it there as well. And so this is something that um, may be deserving of further investigation um, for more than just a few of us. Uh, and um, as really the paradigmatic example of uh, a strong uh, integration between uh, the structural material reality of a building uh, and its outward uh, expression. Uh, in a way, it poses an interesting counterpoint to um, the, the blobs of parametric design because uh, this provides something that is as or more voluptuous and compelling in terms of formal qualities. At the same time, uh, it is limited and narrowed and constrained in way by the material realities of bamboo uh, in ways that uh, the blobs of computer-generated forms uh, can only dream of. And so the resulting power of the forms uh, are often um, something that some of us believe can run circles uh, around anything that uh, the world of abstract form uh, without limitations uh, might offer uh, in the world of computer-generated form.